now we're going to have, I won't take too much time. Rupa Pai is on from Bangalore, India. Thank you for joining us. Rupa Ji, thank you so very, very much. We're excited to have you here. Uh, everybody knows everybody about knows Rupa Pai. Has anybody does not know, go on Who's Who and you'll find her. She's a TEDx speaker out of India. She speaks all the time on the Bhagavad Gita for kids, especially, especially for kids. And we are, some of us are still young, right? So she is a message for some of us too, IG. So she is a message for both the old and the young. So it's there. Um, she has written many, many books. So we did get some books here today. We'll be giving it to some of the kids who are going to perform here today. This is on the Yuga Satras. So with that, let's get Rupa Bhai on. Thank you, Vamshiji, for getting her on. Jai Shri Krishna. Good evening and welcome, Rupa Ji. It's, I know, late in India. Namaste, everyone. And uh, uh, Jai Shri Krishna, I'm delighted to be here speaking to you from Bangalore. Yes, it's quite late. It's uh, 10 o'clock, not too late, 10 p.m. So I'm quite wide awake. I'm quite an owl. So this is very normal time for me uh, to be awake. And anyway, to talk about the Gita, I'm always awake. And uh, like Vivek ji said, you know, uh, that I write and speak to children mostly about the Gita. But, and when I first, when I first wrote the Gita for children, a very elderly gentleman, a friend of the family who translated the book into Canada, which is my home, which is my uh, mother tongue. Uh, he told me, everyone was telling me that, you know, I have uh, titled the book wrong. The Gita for children, you know, it's, it's so much of the wisdom in the Gita is for us as well. So why did you call it the Gita for children? Now it's going to be lost among the bookshelves in bookstores. It's going to be in the children's section. We are not going to find it. And there's so much in it for us. You should have called it the Gita 101 or something. And this uh, Shiv Kumar uncle, who is a friend of the family, he said, no, I think you've titled it perfectly because as Vivekji said, we are all children where the Gita is concerned. There's always, that's why we call her Gita Ma. There's always something to learn. And every time you open the book, depending on your own situation in life at that time, depending on whatever experiences you have had, it speaks to you differently. A different shloka becomes, you know, it becomes full of meaning for us. So having said that, uh, here I am. Thank you so much, Vivek Ji, for inviting me to be here. I really, Guru Maji, pranams to you. Really, really enjoyed hearing your discourse just now. It was so simple and so beautiful. So it really touched my heart. Um, and um, yeah, I'm sure it appeals to children too. But yes, I know that talk, it's, everyone considers it a big challenge, how to bring the Gita to children. And, you know, given my own example, when I start, when I was, when my editor proposed that I write a book about, I mean, a, a sort of retelling of the Gita for children, I was in shock for the first few weeks actually I said no no but it's not meant for children at all so how can you ask me to write it for children and I'm not that kind of author you know I'm a cool writer I write about cool stuff for children sci-fi fantasy adventure not not the Gita and that was because I myself hadn't had much of an engagement with the text and when on my uh, editor's insistence I decided to take her advice and actually go to the Gita with humility, asking it to open itself out to me and teach me what it knew. I, I was blown away by its wisdom. And I said, you know, what a, what a great loss that I wasn't exposed to it when I was growing up. My life would have been very different. And then I decided that, yes, this book would have to be written because our children need to be taught this, to be brought the wisdoms of the, one of the greatest texts of of humankind and it is really a gift to all humankind it's not meant just for Hindus or for Indians you don't have to be part of any culture or religion or belief system to learn from it it is eternal wisdom so uh, Vivekji said okay so you're supposed to be a writer for children and you're supposed to talk to young people so what do you want to call your uh, talk and I said I thought about it I said well it has to be intriguing if it has to bring the kids in it has to make them think a little it has to appeal to their intelligence and not to their emotions, because emotion, this whole bhakti rasa comes later in life, except they have bhakti for basketball and stuff like that, uh, but they don't have bhakti for the larger spiritual things of life, because they haven't faced so many vicissitudes of life yet. So it has to appeal to an American teenager or young person's intelligence, and it will have to resonate with, the, with their 21st century life. So I said, what shall I call it? And I decided to call it how to win every time. Already that's a hook, I thought. 
that you know young people want to win they are full of fire in the belly they want to win everything they get into so how to win every time by losing added that as a corollary how to win every time by losing and i thought my god that sounds really cool and i think we actually agreed with me i'm sure if there are young people in the audience right now they are like rolling their eyes totally and saying yeah what whatever you know but but so now that now that i have done the title i have to make good on my promise and back it up with some solid content so here goes wish me luck so how to win every single time by losing i think the best place is to start is to start where the geeta does with that unforgettable arresting visual of these two krishna and arjuna on in the chariot on the battlefield of kurukshetra right in between the two armies right of course it doesn't start off like that uh, krishna and arjuna are standing in formation in the place they are supposed to be on the pandava side until arjuna decides krishna 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 can you please do me one favor before the war begins and the conches are already blowing and krishna is like why why now why now it's about to start the war is about to start do we have to do this do you really want to do this and arjuna says yes please please take me to the center of the battlefield i want to lock eyes with everybody on the other side i want to make them feel that the personal angel of doom is coming to get them you know i want to destroy their confidence it's called psychological warfare krishna you probably haven't heard of it take take me to the center of the battlefield i want to do this i want to tell them that by the end of the day they will not be standing anymore because this maharathi is coming to get them and krishna said okay so you have to be this show off fine i'll take you to the center of the battlefield because i'm your best friend and i'm a charioteer i only listen to what you say so he goes to the center of the battlefield and just imagine the scene if you were standing on a hill and looking down upon this field 11 akshahinis on one side akshahinis or battalions the kauravas are resplendent in their battle armor 11 of them the dawn is just breaking the dawn has broken the sun is just about to rise and on the other side only seven akshahinis of the pandavas and if you had to make a call or if you were asked to call the winner which side would you call if you didn't know anything more about the people who are fighting you probably would have called oh obviously the kauravas are going to win look how many more of them there are because the human mind is meant to judge quantity against quality you know so you just said yes the kauravas would have won but if then somebody had told you well um, actually that's no ordinary field you know it's not just kurukshetra it's also dharmakshetra and it has known this field has known to favor the good and the righteous uh and then you would have asked then who are the righteous in this case and somebody your interlocutor might have said actually it's the pandavas you know most people believe it's the pandavas that are righteous then you might have had a little doubt and said hmm okay maybe these guys have a chance so anyway back to the battlefield it's early in the morning and if i'm sure many of you all of you know where kurukshetra is in today's india it's a battle it's a field in haryana and we all know that if it if a war has to be fought in haryana or anywhere in the north of india you better choose winter because wars and weddings in north india are always in the winter otherwise you know the war would be over, over before it began everybody would have died of heat stroke so this was november around november october november and the war was about to begin, begin so there's a nip in the air and krishna uh, krishna has driven arjuna to the center of the battlefield and at that moment the conches have blown the war is about to begin and then the most unprecedented thing happens the greatest warrior in the world collapses he has a nervous breakdown collapses to the floor of the chariot his bow gandiva slips from his clammy hands his knees turn to jelly and he is a picture of absolute despair and you know imagine this if you were looking at it if you were the same observer you would have said what happened what has happened to the great warrior what a coward look at him he has collapsed what a picture of absolute pathos how pathetic is he but if you had been closer to the to what arjuna's mind was going through you would have said it was the most fearless act to collapse like that because what is so fearless about it the fact that arjuna was able to shut out the pandavas and their emotions what they would have felt if they saw him collapse and the kauravas and their emotions in that moment he forgot he put his blinkers on he did not care what the pandavas thought and what would you think would have been going on in the pandavas mind oh my god our greatest hero 
what's happened? If he's gone, our morale is gone. We'll never be able to win. And they would have lost half the battle already. And Arjuna cared about his brothers and he would have, you know, he should have been scared about them losing their morale, but he didn't. He shut them out. He shut out the Kauravas who were already beginning to rejoice a little bit in their hearts. Oh my God, this guy is actually going to leave the battlefield. If he goes, we may well have a chance, you know, I hope he goes. And that would have increased the morale of the other side. And he knew what that would do to the result of the war. If they were, if the Kauravas were coming in with much more, with much higher spirits and much higher morale than his own side, surely they would win. But in that moment, Arjuna told himself that I will ignore these guys. I will ignore those guys. And for this moment, until I have resolved this conflict in my head, I will focus only and only on Krishna. And that is what we can do. So that is the picture that opens the Gita. And what ends the Gita? The warrior stands up again. Now his mind is absolutely crystal clear. When he looks at the other side, he does not see the faces of his nearest and dearest, his closest family. He does not see the face of his adored guru, Dronacharya, who taught him to pick up a bow in the first place. He does not see the face of his beloved Pitamaha, grandfather Bhishma, who has been more than a father to him. Instead, what he sees solely, just like the great archer he was, just like the great warrior he was. Remember when he was a young prince and Drona asked him to, ask everybody, what do you see in the archery competition when he was teaching them archery? All the Pandavas, all the Kauravas, and they said, I see the tree, I see a bird hanging from it, I see the eye of the bird. And Arjuna was the only one who said, I see nothing but the eye of the bird, which is my target. And that was how his energies were entirely focused, entirely channeled. At the, when, the, when the Gita ends, he said, it's time, let's go. And in that brief interaction, in that brief moment, because obviously even though the Gita is 700 shlokas long, it happened in the twinkling of an eye, this entire conversation, because otherwise the sun would have risen and the war would have begun. So in that brief transition, Arjuna had already won. And he had won before he had fired his very first shot. How, you may ask, how has he won? And he had won by losing. And you say, really? What did he lose? How did he win? Well, the Gita is really about not, it's not at all about war with somebody else. It's not, not about competition with someone outside of you. It is a war that you fight with yourself, you know, with your deluded mind fights for control. And it's the, it's the spirit, it's the higher mind, the intelligent mind, the intellectual discerning mind, which is full of discretion, which then wins. That is the war, that, that is the war of Kurukshetra really. And that's a war we fight in every moment of our lives. And that war Arjuna had won by conquering his mind, by conquering his emotions, right? And, and uh, th that is the war we are supposed to win. And what happens in our lives? Every day is a Kurukshetra. Every field that we walk through is a Kurukshetra. Every day we go out into the world and we are forced to do battle. Not battle with swords and guns and bows and arrows, hopefully, but war with ourselves, with our choices. What are the moral choices we are going to make? And in that moment, what should we lose to make sure that we make a good choice? We lose what Arjuna lost. What did he lose? He lost the attachment, the raga, the karma that he felt for his own people. You know, when he first said to Krishna, how can I do this Krishna? They are my people, mama janaha. How can I destroy them? In what heaven will there be a place for someone like me? And when he, when he said Mama Janaha, what was predominant? What was dominant in him? Ego, ahamkara, mine, the feeling of I-ness, ness These are my people and therefore they are somehow more precious, more worthy of my forgiveness and compassion than anyone else. And Krishna disabuses him throughout the Gita. He says, there is no Mama Janaha. There is only your dharma. So just because they are your people, they are somehow supposed to be forgiven, is it? Does it make their sin any less? Does it make their adharma any less? Does it make your duty as a soldier any different because they are related to you, because they are dear to you? It should not, Arjuna. 
you know, they have brought it upon themselves by what they have done. If it was someone you did not know, how easily, how, how unhesitatingly you would have picked your bow and destroyed it because that is your nature. You are a warrior and a leader. You're a kshatriya and your job and your nature is to destroy adharma where you find it. It does not matter in who, if, who the person doing the adharma is because they have called it upon themselves by their actions. This is karma. This is what happens when you do certain actions. There are certain consequences and you have nothing to do with it. And you are not supposed to be confusing yourself with these things. You are supposed to see what your dharma is and do it. So by the end of that conversation, Arjuna had lost his ego, that feeling of these is mine and these are not mine. Once he lost that attachment, the raga, the karma for something, he also lost dvesha, which is the other big enemy, right? If you, if you do something because you feel it is good or because you enjoy it, that is just as bad as not doing something because you don't enjoy it or you think it is wrong in some way. Whatever is your dharma as a student, as a mother, as a parent, as a teacher, as a uh, corporate employee, whatever, whatever is your dharma, you have to do it without loving it or hating it. Samatvam, always feeling a sense of equilibrium, doing your duty simply because it must be done. What else did Arjuna lose in the course of the Bhagavad Gita? How did he win by losing? What else did he lose? He lost his confusion. He lost his delusion. And where does delusion come from? Delusion comes from seeing yourself as a very limited individual connected only to these other people and not connected to anything or anyone else. That delusion has to be destroyed says uh, Krishna, how does it have to be destroyed? When, when is it destroyed? When you have darshana. And what is darshana? When the veils of ignorance and conditioning fall away from your mind and your eyes and you see yourself as you truly are, not your body, not your mind, not your thoughts, not your emotions, not a limited being that is, has a few limited connections, but as a limitless, supremely powerful and whole complete being that is radiant and luminous in itself and does not need any other, uh, any other thing, any other person, any other situation to, to draw strength from. You draw strength only from yourself and you see that whatever divine spark that you carry in you that makes you limitless and, and, and invincible is also carried, the same divine spark is carried by every other individual every other creature, every other non-creature in the universe. You see yourself as part of a giant web of interdependence where every, which, which, which is able to sustain only if every single being in it and non-being in it does its own dharma. You know how Krishna says, the moment you see everything, you see me in everything, and everything in you, you see yourself in everything and everything in you, Arjuna, that's when you are illuminated. That's when, and in the Upanishads, we, you know, we know that the Gita is the distilled wisdom of the Upanishad. Veda Vyasa very smartly decided that no one's going to read all the Upanishads. They're so abstract. All that great, great wisdom will be lost if I don't somehow condense the best parts of it, distill the essence, the rust of all the Upanishadic wisdom and put it in a compact text that will be accessible to everyone. And that's how he created the Gita. And in the Upanishads, there are the Mahavakya, the four great pronouncements, which say this over and over again. You know how, you know, you're familiar with this one, I'm sure. Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahman. And Brahman was the Upanishad, Upanishadic word for the vast one, for the, for the cosmic energy. The, that some people call God. If you want to do Bhakti Yoga, you call it God. If you want to do Gnana Yoga, you just call it Brahman. That divine spark of the cosmos that, 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 that helps the sun shine and the winds blow and the planets orbit. And hopefully today it will also help the Chandrayaan go into the lunar orbit, the Indian uh, satellite. 
uh, the moon lander will hopefully go into the moon, lunar orbit. It already must have by this time. I haven't been checking the news, but that same cosmic energy is the one that you carry in yourself. So if you think that you're you are not as powerful as this, not as radiant as the sun, not as deep and vast as water, not as all pervading as space, not as compassionate and giving and fertile as the earth, as generous as the earth, perish the thought because you are, you carry the cosmos within you. You are made of the exact same elements that make up the cosmos and therefore you are limitless. Now, once you are able to think of yourself as aham brahmasmi and brah comes from the root, uh, Brahman comes from the root Brah, which just means vast. If you're able to look beyond your little limited self and your little limited mind and think of my people and my house and my, uh, my toys and my devices and my job, and you're able to expand your awareness to include everybody and everything in it, that's all. The fear is gone. You know, you have lost one more thing and you have won. What have you lost this time? You have lost the fear that you are somehow small and powerless and need to defend yourself and hold on to things. Otherwise, someone will take it away from you. The moment you lose that fear, you are able to, you're able to uh, achieve what all Vedanta, all the ancient Indian texts tell you is the purpose of life. Unlike the American model, the purpose of life is not life and not the pursuit of happiness, but the other thing in between, which liberty, which uh, the Indian texts uh, interpret as something even bigger than just personal liberty. It interprets it as moksha, nirvana, you know, just the freedom, mukti, to be absolutely free of the ties of the world and earthly pleasures and sensual pleasures and that feeling of me and you as separate, liberated, all those lines are erased and blurred and gone. You know, so that, that is what we are hoping, we hope to achieve. And that is what Arjuna had achieved by the end of it. He did not, the thing was, he when he lost the emotion of fear and despair and everything by the end of the Gita conversation, he also lost his feeling of hate. Or, or a feeling of superiority to the other side. When he said, you know, when he said to Krishna in the beginning, uh, take me there so that I can make eye contact so they will all be destroyed by the end of the war, Krishna, that was his human side coming out. That was his emotion that, oh God, they've been so mean, so awful to me and my family. They have been awful to my wife. They've been awful to this land, to the earth, to the people of this, uh, of this kingdom. And it's my duty to destroy them uh, because they are, they are, not worthy because they are not, uh, they don't deserve to be there. That feeling had gone as well. He just saw them as, uh, he didn't even see them as people anymore. He just saw his own duty and he felt no rancor towards the other side at all. And that is what truly means vairagya, to have detachment, to be able to uh, do your duty without feeling any strong emotion, without feeling a sense of triumph when you have achieved something without feeling a sense of despair when you haven't so-called won, that you have somehow lost. There is no losing. There is no winning. When the war is against yourself, when the war is about your higher, always harnessing your higher mind, always reaching up for the higher self and not succumbing to the desires of the base self, when that is the war to be fought, that is the war you fight alone. There is nothing else to be won on the outside. Everything else that happens on the outside ceases to matter. It's just an experience. Because as you know, you have no right over the fruit of your actions. You only have a right to do your action well. And that is possible for each one of us. That is entirely in our control. What happens outside as a result of our actions who knows? There are too many things at play in the world. We can never be sure that we will achieve what we have set out to achieve. If you work hard or not, if you really, if you're working towards a particular goal, rest assured that you're setting yourself up for disappointment because you have no control over what happens as a result of your actions. We are very limited in that sense. I mean, because we are embodied, what we can perceive as the possible consequences of our action are very small. 
right? So that is why leave that. Leave that to Krishna. He says, leave it to me. Just do what you have to do in a spirit of sacrifice. Lose. Lose the goal. Forget about the goal. Your, your only goal is me. Just offer up all your actions to me, Arjuna, and I will take you home. I will bring you home. Don't worry. Just, just offer your actions to me. And Krishna also says, you know, about the eternal cycle of give and take between gods and men. He says, if you don't put your own shoulder to the wheel, behave like the universe. The sun doesn't call in sick. The wind doesn't say it can't uh, do its duty because it's feeling lazy. Everything else in the universe, it's doing its dharma without expecting anything in return. How dare you not do the same thing? You are already blessed. Everything you do is already a return gift to the universe for what you have already received, blessings you have already received. And do it in that spirit, in the spirit of gratitude and a spirit of sacrifice. I have, in, have already received so much. Now it's just my duty to give back. So lose your ego, lose your anger. Where does anger come from? Anger comes from ego. When you think of yourself as your body and your mind and your emotions, and you take everything that somebody else says personally, and then you get angry. He says, but you're not that. You're an invincible spirit. Purnam Adam, Purnam Id, Purnam Adah, Purnam Idam. You are complete and luminous in, it, in yourself. You don't need anything or anyone else to fulfill you. And because you are complete, nothing that no one, that anyone says can ever harm you. You're already complete being. You are the rider in the chariot, Arjuna. You are not the horses of the mind, which uh, of the senses which are all the wayward horses of the senses and desire that are always pulling in five different directions at once. You are not the reins, which is the lower mind, which, which goes, which, which you know, is held tight or loose. It, it controls the horses, but how tight the reins are held, that is what is important. And who is controlling the reins, Arjuna? That is your buddhi, your discrimination, your discretion. But even that is not you. Neither the chariot, which is your body is you. Neither are the horses you, or uh, the horses of the senses. Neither are the reins of the lower mind. Neither are the, are the, is the chariot, which is the higher mind. But you are the rider in the chariot and you can appeal to the charioteer to take you where you want to go. If you tell the charioteer to hold the reins with just the right amount of pressure, not too loose so that the horses skitter away in five different directions, not so tight that they feel constrained and cannot enjoy the journey, but just a light pressure so that the horses stay on the path, then you are a winner. And where do you think that whole visual of the Gita comes from? The chariot for the four horses, not five, but the four white horses and Arjuna, the rider in the chariot, Krishna is the chariot here. So when you let God, when you let Krishna drive your chariot, when, when you let your higher mind rule your actions and guide your actions, then you're always a winner. Thank you so much. Namaste. I see a question from, I see some questions from the audience. Should I respond? Vivekji, I guess I will, <laughs> it's because nobody's telling me not to. So the first question is, do you travel to the US? Can we invite you for a spiritual conference in Austin? There are many young people and adults who will benefit from your talks. Well, thank you so much for saying so. I would love to travel but I, I, to the US. I don't normally travel as a matter of course, but I have. Last year I was there in October. Uh, I spoke at the Asia Society in New York. So, and address some schools. I went to schools in the New York area, in Manhattan, actually. That was fun. Uh, talking to them about the Gita uh, schools that, had, that didn't have Indian kids and uh, had only uh, a lot of American kids, white kids, uh, Jewish kids, and they took to it beautifully. I, I really enjoyed the response there. So I do come once in a while, but it's not on, I mean, not on a regular circuit of speaking in the US or anything. But thank you for saying that, and I would love to come. Uh, how should youngsters or anyone make choices using Bhagwan uh, versus elders or friends giving advice, peer pressure? Yeah, it's a very difficult one. Um, it's a difficult one, but I put it this way to children. 
when I uh, talk to them. I say, see, how, why did Arjuna put his problems in Krishna's hands? Why did he unhesitatingly put his problem into Krishna's hands? Because Krishna and he were best, best friends, best friends forever, BFFs. We say that in India. The kids say, BFF, she's my BFF, and he's my BFF, my best friend forever. Well, Krishna and Arjuna were like that, best friends. And I say that, you know, Krishna is the kind of best friend who always has your back. He knows you better than you know yourself. And you don't have to call him Krishna, by the way. You can call him a she. You can give him any other name. You can call him Jesus or Allah or Waheguru, whatever you want, whatever speaks to you. But we all know that there is a still small voice inside us that knows exactly what is right for us. It may not have the conventional wisdom that everybody else is telling you that this is the right thing because you are a unique person. What, what works for everyone else may not work for you. And we discover it to our detriment at so many times in our life when we listen to what other people say and we go along with it and then feel rotten at the end of it because somehow what we did doesn't sit well with us. Everybody else, all our friends have done the same thing and they're flourishing and prospering and these don't seem to have any regret or guilt or remorse, but we do. And that's the important thing to find out your nature, what do I like? What do I dislike? What kind of action uh, will I be able to live with the consequences of? So I tell children, just, just pause before you do anything. And action doesn't mean something you do with your hands. Every thought you think, every word you speak, every deed that you do creates vibrations in the world. And those vibrations will spread large enough to come back to you someday and affect you. So be very mindful. Ask how can you be mindful about your action? Pause, talk to your Krishna. Now, suddenly, if you suddenly in the middle of the day, you want to talk to Krishna, okay, chop, chop, Krishna, speak up. I need to your advice now. He's not going to wake up and start speaking to you. Why? Why did he speak to Arjuna then? Because Arjuna had cultivated that friendship over many, many years. Many, many times he had placed his dilemmas in Arjuna, in Krishna's hands. Many times he had taken Krishna's advice found that it worked for him. That's how the trust had been built. And I tell kids, that's how you should build trust with your Krishna. Every day at the end of each day, sit by yourself in a quiet place, maybe even your room, but shut the door, sit by yourself, speak to your Krishna, tell him how your day went and what made things you did that made you feel a little uncomfortable because you did it because, you, because it was cool at the time, but you know, I'm not feeling so good about it now, Krishna. And listen to what Krishna says. He might even just say, you know, then, you know, now you know from next, when, when it happens next time, you know what to do. You know, you know what pitfalls to avoid. Or he may say, well, that was not a very nice thing to do, don't you think? How will you feel better? Maybe if I apologize to my friend, I'll feel better. Okay, go and do it. Try it. Then, you, then it's up to you to take his advice. You go do it and then come back and have another conversation with Krishna and say, my God, that really worked, Krishna. I feel so much better now, thank you. And that's how a trust is built. And the more you talk to Krishna, the better and stronger your inner voice will become. You will stop, you know, those blinkers will come on. I don't care what my friends think. I don't care what my parents are saying. What they are saying might have worked for them. It may not work for me, but I'm going to listen to my own counsel. I'm going to shut out everybody's voices. And I'm going to sit with myself, think of what is best for me and do it. So, you know, it, when I say this to kids, they seem to get very affected by it. And they say, well, I'm going to try it. Some of them, the ones who, uh, who are little, you know, okay to say these things in front of their friends, or they will come to me later and say, yeah, maybe I should try it. Because, you know, it's true that some things that other people seem to enjoy and seem to not feel bad about doing, I, it doesn't sit well with me. And I say, yes, the point is to discover your own nature and then abide by it. Because that's what Krishna says. Stay, stay true to your own nature, Arjuna. Your nature is that of a kshatriya, someone who dharma rakshak, you protect dharma. So don't try to be some monk now. Don't try, don't say getting away to the hills and meditating, running away from the battlefield is the right thing for you. Pause, think about it, speak to me, tell me your doubts, let me clear them for you. But in the end, and I love this part about the Gita, in the end, when Arjuna says, okay, Krishna, you have, I totally trust you. Now I believe you, Vasudeva. Now you just tell me what I should do and I will do it. Krishna said, 
not even a chance. Are you kidding me? I am not telling you what to do. I have only presented the options. I have told you what might happen if you choose this course, what might happen. I have asked you to think about it. Now you decide. And that's another great lesson, you know, that you should own your action. You can't depend on somebody else telling you what to do, to, even when it is Krishna. You can have a conversation with him. You can listen to what he has. Definitely listen to what your parents have to say. Definitely listen to what your friends have to say. But in the end, sit down by yourself, have that final conversation with Krishna and make your own decision because the karma will only stick to you, not to anybody else. And there's no point blaming somebody else for what you did. Were there any other questions? Or I think we're out of time, right? So dharma should make you decide the right actions. So many things are looked at as negative action and many things may not have the approval of your friends or family. But if you have acted, if you have passed, if you have, if your action, if you have put your action through the litmus test before doing it, and what are the litmus tests that Krishna puts out? Is your action being guided by an emotion? If it is being like Krishna's action of collapsing and saying, I will not fight, was guided by extreme love, extreme attachment, sudden attachment that came. Yeah, yes, thank you. This will be my last question. So uh, I will not answer any. So um, is it guided by emotion? then maybe it's not right action. Then is it guide, even if the emotion is love? I mean, love is actually just as bad or worse than uh, other emotions. So, and that, that was, if you look at the Mahabharata, that illustrates it beautifully. I mean, Dhritarashtra's blindness could, have, could, could absolutely mean a metaphorical blindness to the faults of his own sons. He could not see it. And that was why did why why did that why were his eyes clouded? Why could he not see? Because of extreme love for his sons. So and and then his wife Gandhari, instead of saying that I will be the eyes and I will make sure dharma happens, decided to shut her eyes as well. You know. So is was that a good thing on her part? Was she like saying I'll do what my husband does? Is that a right thing? When your husband has shut his eyes to the dharma. Should you also do the same because you're such a loyal wife or should you be the other person in the equation who says, well, then I'm going to be the bad guy. I'm going to be the tough parent, you know? So that's, anyway, so have you, uh, is it guided by emotion? Then it's probably not a right action. Have you thought mindfully about the action you're going to do before you do it? Is it impulsive action? Then maybe it's wrong. Think about it. Think of whom it, who will be affected. Think of the consequences of your action and then decide which consequence you will be able to live with and do that action. And many times what happens is we have not been able to think of certain consequences that happen when we do actions, consequences that we didn't anticipate at all happens. And in that case, are you willing to still take responsibility for your action? Are you still willing to own it? Do you feel that this is what needs to be done in this moment so absolutely you feel it? that you don't care what anybody or anyone else says and you are not, your action is not being guided by emotion. It's not even guided by a feeling of, oh, I'm so virtuous, I'm doing the right thing. You know, I'm, I'm like a cool guy, I'm doing the right thing. Always not even that. I'm doing it because it needs to be done and I totally believe it. So I do it with complete detachment. If you can do it that way, then possibly right action. But, you know, we never know. Thank you so much. Namaste. Jai Shri Krishna. Your charioteer. Connect with the higher power on a daily, hourly, minute-by-minute -minute basis. And that's how you can get Krishna in your mind. And it's Arjuna and Krishna everyday dialogue. How are you? I'm not good. I'm, I'm having problems. Okay, so keep talking. I think that's the way to do it. So thank you for sharing, Rupaji. Thank you so very much.